Hey, I'm here in the administrative offices of the Port of Portland Terminal 6. And before we go on a quick tour of these facilities, uh, let's review some things quickly. So in some recent stats in the year 2022, there was approximately 25.3 trillion US dollars in world merchandise trade. Now that was up 12% over 2021, probably due to the rampant inflation over that kind of period of, of, of a year. Um, in 2022, export of US goods and services surpassed $3 trillion for the first time in history, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis. USTR statistics looking at Oregon's merchandise exports of made in USA products that exceeded $22 billion in 2018, but by 2022, Oregon's exports of merchandise uh, exceeded 34 billion US dollars. That's a really big jump, again, probably due to that inflation that we were talking about, but also perhaps due to the pent up demand that we saw during the peak quarters of the global pandemic. Um, Oregon exports ranked 17th in the country in dollar volume in the year 2022. Of course, import-export activity, as I've said continuously, is the backbone of global trade. And still, to this day, merchandise import and export, that is consumer goods and commercial goods, your commodities, agricultural products, natural resources, this still makes up the greater bulk of global trade. So how important is the Port of Portland to Oregon's trade? Let's talk to an important figure here at Terminal 6 to find out. Hi, I'm Tim Veach, Professor of Global Business at George Fox University. Nice to meet you, Tim. I'm Fred Meyer. I'm the uh, manager of Marine Terminal 6 here at the Port of Portland. And that is where we are today. And we are going to take a tour and see how global business works. This is a 419 acre parcel of land uh, dedicated to uh, marine business, global business, if you will. Uh, in the center of this 419 acres is about 125 acres of container operations terminal, 65 acres of intermodal yard, which is rail yard, rail business, bringing in and delivering and exporting uh, containers on rail. And then on both ends are two large parking lots uh, where Auto Warehousing Corporation brings in and uh, imports and exports automobiles. And that is uh, through uh, Glovis Shipping. And we bring in and export uh, uh, General Motors and uh, other uh, Ford and uh, Fiat Chrysler, FCA or Stellantis uh, automobiles. So that is the breadth of the 419 acre terminal. And uh, later on, we'll do a uh, driving tour of everything, go up in a crane, show, show you everything from the bird's eye view. But uh, just expanding a little bit, we are located in the industrial section of Rivergate here in North Portland. Welcome to Terminal 6. Yeah, we're going to put these safety vests on and get some, uh, some hard hats ready so we can be safe as we get in the car and begin our tour. A reminder, you're kind of in the public lot. All around us is the uh, barbed wire fence because as of 2003, the Maritime Transportation Security Act in the post 9-11-2001 era, a lot more restrictive security regimen was put in place across the nation for all of these places, these marine terminals and other terminals that do a lot of business and bring in a lot of foreign cargo uh, now there are, you know, an extensive security regimen, like I said. I just wanted to show you the entrance to the container terminal. Every truck that comes in goes through this blue shed off to my left. We call it the optical character recognition shed. It's taking pictures of the license plate, the container number, and the chassis number. All that data is going into what we call the container yard kitchen. Those blue shaped windows over there, that's the kitchen. The clerks are on the top floor conversing with each and every truck that's getting weighed at our scales here after making sure that all the data that was taken from the optical character recognition shed is processed into our software. We call it Tideworks. We have different softwares to manage the yard, 
to manage vessel operations and to manage rail operations. So that is what is uh, being transferred to the supervisors in the trucks all throughout the yard that are telling these trucks where to go. Kind of a follow me type of operation. That's why these guys are waiting here to find out where in the yard they are going to drop off their container. Now these containers are either exports going out on the next ship to Asia, or some of them might just be empties that someone already took out earlier, emptied, and is bringing back the empty, because we are also a repository for empty containers, which of course belong to Mediterranean Shipping Company or SM Line. Our last ship, we dropped off a bun bunch of containers in this area over here. Those now have to go to the rail. In order to go to the rail, the first thing that has to happen, because Customs and Border Protection requires it, is that every one of those import containers that's going to rail has to be scanned through our outgate here, this blue shed. And then behind the outgate, you can see two yellow devices. That's a radiation portal monitor. Customs and Border Protection um, requires us for every import to be scanned for radiation. And this is all based on uh, 2001, 9-11-2001, the terrorist attack that changed everything. I mean, that's how Customs and uh, Border Patrol were combined into CBP. That never used to be that way. Okay, Tim, this is the out gate. Much like we saw the blue in gate, the blue shack monitoring everything coming in, we've got to make sure that we monitor and check out every container that's left so we know what's on the terminal and what is left, obviously, for obvious reasons. So, uh, cameras in this shack are taking pictures, again, of the container, the chassis, and the license plate to make sure we know what's leaving. In addition, every container has to be scanned through this yellow RPM, or radiation portal monitor. Behind me, Customs and Border Protection is manning a booth and will, if they have something suspicious, they will take that truck through a secondary scanner behind the booth, which you can see right over there. So it's a security and a tracking system right here. Obviously that is a reach, we call it a reach stacker. Another name for it is a top loader. It's just an enormous, super heavy on the back end machine that lifts up the containers, puts them on a chassis for obvious use out on the, uh, to deliver the goods. So those uh, reach stackers, we have uh, 22 of them, a very important piece of gear. So now we're just driving north toward the port of Vancouver, across the river and toward the Columbia River. And this is the 603 dock. We have three docks in the middle here, two auto docks for a total of five berths, vessel berths at this terminal. This is 2,900 feet of continuous dock in the middle. And this is where we take the big container ships. The marine terminal is one small piece of this big marine infrastructure that gets these ships here. If you look that direction, you're looking directly west, the ocean is 105 miles away. The Army Corps of Engineers, using their dredges and the Port of Portland's dredge Oregon, is constantly dredging a 43-foot channel, which is how deep it has to be to take the biggest ships that we take, and 600 foot wide channel that is constantly being, because of the river flow, beset by additional sand. So they're always dredging to make sure that we can stay commercially effective all the way out 105 miles. And the ports of Vancouver, Kalama, Longview, and Portland, and Columbia County all, all rely on it. So anyway, it just takes a lot of infrastructure and support to make this marine operation work. So these are the smaller cranes over yeah. here, Fred? Yes, these are the 50-foot gauge. So it's an older style crane uh, that can't reach out as far uh, because it doesn't have as much weight or capability. It's a little slower and it's slightly less capable as far as the tonnage it can raise. We still use these cranes, but we use our what we call our post-Panamax cranes or uh, the much larger cranes that have a 100-foot 100 foot gauge between the rails, they're able to reach out further, they're heavier, and they're faster and more capable than the 
the 50 foot gauge. So this end of the dock is our business end for the larger container ships from Mediterranean Shipping Company and SM line that we receive. We use these more capable cranes 100% of the time. Uh, these we call, again, post Panamax cranes. And that refers to the fact that they can work the larger ships that are too large for fitting through the old Panama Canal. That's where the phrase post Panamax comes from. All right, Tim and gentlemen, we're going to uh, take a trip over to Crane 80. Uh, it's one of our most capable and, and uh, recent cranes, 100 foot gauge rail gantry crane that we use for our uh, largest vessels. We're just gonna take a tour up into the uh, control house, show you how it all works. So here we are <laughs> at the Port of Portland's crane 6379, uh, one of our post Panamax cranes and most capable cranes. Uh, it's in standby mode now. We don't have the boom down because we don't have a ship. We're not working a container vessel. So we'll show you that part. Over to the right is Auto Warehousing Corporation's huge parking lot for all those uh, imported and exported autos. And then the container yard, obviously underneath us, all the way upriver. And then in the distance, you can see our intermodal yard with two stack high containers on the Union Pacific uh, train chassis that are getting ready to be loaded to go to Chicago, Memphis, and Kansas City. Just wanted to get another view of one of our uh, heavy duty cranes. This is crane 79 here with the 100 foot gauge rail between the two rails here. So obviously more uh, capable. The, this crane is in standby mode. In other words, it's not uh, deployed down, which it would be over a vessel when they come in to actually lift the containers off the vessel. With our size, our cranes are large. Even larger cranes are able to go up higher. They're built taller, but they also can reach out further. We're finding that the, as the ships get bigger, we're almost limited, well, we are limited to our largest cranes being able to reach out 18 containers wide. If a ship comes in more than 18 wide, that's a pretty big ship. We have to ask them to plan it so that we don't have to go any further than 18. So it's just the limitations. We're very successful, but we just need to make sure that ships that come in know our operational limitations. So this yellow uh, lift here. That is the head block. The head block goes all the way out along the entire arm. Right. And that can then pick up whatever it's picking up, which could be a container. Right. Looks like it picks up the exact size of a container. Yep. Will that be able to pick up your brake bulk as well? Yes. Or is, okay. Yeah. Uh, we bring in brake bulk units on flat racks that look that mimic a container often on these big ships. Um, and that head block, that's the business end, locks in to the corners of the container or the flat rack. And on every corner of these containers, if you look closer, you can see a hole. There's a piece of steel that moves down in, moves 90 degrees, locks in times four, and that's how the container gets lifted. And they lift those just one container at a time? One container at so a time. So if you got 10,000 containers, you lift 10,000 containers one at a one time? One at a time. If you had 10,000 containers, which we don't get that many moves here, uh, we usually do uh, at the most about 2,000, you have three cranes working. Our goal, Tim, is to go 30 moves an hour per crane. In other words, one every two minutes. Okay. That's so moving could, pretty fast. So you could get 90 containers per hour off of the ship. Three cranes, right. right. So 90 times eight hours of work, that's 720. And then we would work nighttime, usually two or three gangs. You don't have to work just during the day. And then you would finish the next day with three more gangs. So that's how we refer to it. Three gangs, two at night, three the next day. And it's time is money with container ships. As soon as you're done, they're sailing to the next port. Fred, I've heard that, you know, we all know that there was this kind of the supply chain bottleneck, especially with the ships coming in from overseas. How were we affected here at the Port of Portland by the supply chain bottleneck? We were affected positively. Uh huh. Yeah. Because all of those vessels, I'll just 
pick LA as an example, we're getting bottlenecked in LA. 50, 60, 70 ships at anchor waiting for weeks to get their goods off. They started looking for other creative ways to get rid of their cargo so that they could continue their, their uh, journey. They found the Port of Portland. I mean, frankly, that's one way after we had SM line that we were able to bring in MSC. They saw us as a niche port. They had the right size vessels to bring in. So we were kind of an outlet when some of these other bigger ports had a huge backlog of vessels. All right, shall we, can we go this yes. way? Is that okay? Yeah, we're just gonna go into the operator's cab okay. and then that's it. This is really cool looking down. Like what if these stairs broke? Definitely are an, a much older cab. The other ones look a lot nicer. Oh, fantastic, look at this, come on. But you can sit, just don't touch a whole lot. Sit in the, key, in the seat if you want. This is where a gantry crane operator at Terminal 6 sits. Directly over Oh, jeez. You got it? <laughs> Directly over the head block, which is the device that locks into the container, and then he moves it with obviously these controls back and forth. After a... So they're gonna use these controls, lift the head block, lift the containers with the head block, and then load it onto the trucks. Yep that are then moving those containers throughout the shipyard. That's right. And after a quick training lesson, Tim is actually going to show us how to do it. That's a joke. Oh. <laughs> right now, we're about 120 feet above the ground. When this uh, crane is in operation, it can reach out probably about 120 feet to the far reaches of the vessel, pick up the uh, container and bring it in. A, an efficient crane operation is about 30 moves an hour. So they're moving a container every two minutes. That's pretty fast and that's pretty efficient. And we like that because uh, it costs a lot to pay these uh, crane operators. And then when the, when the ship is all done, it sails. All the containers that have been imported are here and the commercial trucks come in to get their cargo. This is our hazmat or hazardous material storage area. For, for instance, right now we uh, import a lot of fireworks. So those are kind of a hazardous cargo that we put in the middle of the yard away from any public access. We're officially and unceremoniously going into the rail yard here. Eight IPI. Eight tracks, about 30,000 feet of rail that the Union Pacific brings in what we call bear tables or bear train that we then load too high with imported IPI cargo coming off SM line ships and going into Chicago, Memphis, and Kansas City. This is about a 60 acre lot. It takes a lot of asphalt when you're trying to discharge three to 4,000 vehicles, brand new vehicles uh, off of a uh, vessel. They've got to go somewhere. So this is how they park them. Where are, these where are these vehicles going, Fred? These are going, like I said, 80% are going on rail to inland parts of the country. Where exactly, I can't tell you. Where are they coming from then? They are coming uh, from uh, overseas. I don't know the exact Asian port that they come from. So I've, these are US branded vehicles which are manufactured or at overseas. least assembled overseas. Right. That's right. And after they're assembled overseas, they're re-imported essentially to that, the U.S. and then right. shipped out to different different uh, U.S. Rail, dealerships, right? Dealerships throughout the U.S. Yep. by rail here from Port of Portland. The other piece of this that I'm learning is uh, longshore labor brings them in here to the first point of rest. Everything else on the other side of that fence is done by a different union, the Teamsters. The Teamsters are the ones that take these vehicles, which are not U.S. road legal yet. They have to all be processed to have certain uh, pieces of equipment, certain warning signs in English, and other little things uh, redone in the processing center on the other side of this lot. So these are not quite ready oh, to go to a dealership and be sold yet. They have to be further processed. This is biz, uh, this is like ops management right here. This is fantastic. Yeah. Because we, we assume that the operations, when they're coming in, imported these are not knockdown items we assume these are these are final 
you know, products ready for the consumer to, to go ahead and just purchase them. Right. But what you're suggesting is that actually there's kind of some after production that goes on. Right, here in the U.S. How important is the Port of Portland to Oregon's trade? I'd say we are very important, Tim. Uh, as you may know, we are the only, this terminal specifically is the only container terminal in the state. So, I mean, we are, we have a lot of Oregon businesses that are dependent on our ability to bring their cargo to and from Asia. Finished products, you know, hay feed, uh, to feed their, their livestock over there. Uh, we are the only terminal that can do that in the state. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, small businesses across the state and in the Idaho and Eastern Washington agricultural regions that rely on the ability to have their hay, for instance, exported out through our terminal. What would you say are what do you see more than anything else in terms of, of exports, product-wise or categories? What I just said, the animal hay, the animal feed. There is a lot of that coming from the, uh, the eastern parts of Oregon, southern parts of Oregon, eastern Washington and Idaho coming into this uh, area for export to Asia. Alfalfa, That's a primary. things like that. But yes, exactly. So you heard me talk about our tenant here, auto warehousing, that's bringing in these thousands of GM autos uh, and exporting the Stellantis, the Fiats, the Chryslers. The imports are all going through this processing building over here to get made ready for US road use. So the final thing I haven't talked about at all is just the very good relationship we have with Union Pacific and Burlington Northern Santa Fe. A lot of this doesn't work without those two key class one railroad operations feeding us, taking our goods in and out. And uh, they're both uh, very good for us, Union Pacific and Burlington Northern Santa Fe. And the final thing I'll say is it works, another reason it works very well is the river makes it easier for rail access. It's a much more level approach, uh, bringing a train down either side of the Columbia River than it is to bring trains over the mountains into Seattle, over the Cascades. Oh, sure, sure. That's just more energy uh, and more expense. So we're in a good place at the bottom of the Columbia River for that more level rail approach. And that is a key piece of our intermodal success. Fred, can I ask another question? Yes. What, what do you see as the outlook for, for exports, for Oregon exports moving forward? Are we looking towards an in, in continued increase or are you- That is a good question. I think, yes. Uh, we're probably looking at staying the same or, or slightly increasing. Uh, you know, just as the demand continues for those agricultural products that animals uh, feed and the hay in Asia, as those populations grow, it'll stay the same or increase. As we've seen today, the movement of merchandise in terms of logistics and shipping across borders and even within the same country is simultaneously simple and complex. There are a lot of moving parts and a lot of infrastructure and people involved in those processes. I urge you to watch videos that show pictures of containers being moved or that show the actual different processes of moving things around the world in uh, this amazing activity called international trade. And that concludes our tour of the Port of Portland. I hope you enjoyed.